you have to use it because if you don't, you're going to fall so far behind that life just becomes like untenable. Bitcoin is very defensible. It's easy to protect. It's hard to steal. The return on investment for violence goes down. The existence of Bitcoin kind of forces fiscal responsibility you know, on everyone, but states in particular, because they've previously had the privilege to, you know, print money as they choose and the citizenry has to pick up the bill. You're just limiting the set of people who you can steal from because you can only really steal from people who don't have Bitcoin. It basically makes empires less profitable. And so I think states are going to shrink. Bitcoin gives you the incentive to provide value and not to cheat. Obviously, inflation taxes are undemocratic and most people don't even know that that's what that is. They just see the prices go up and they think that's like the way it's, it has to be. They don't even know that they're being taxed. Countries that adopt the Bitcoin standard just do better. And I think people are going to have a really hard time denying that. Inflation right now doesn't mean the increase of the money supply the way it used to. Like that that used to be what that word meant. It's like, it, it, think about the word. You inflate something. What are you inflating? You're inflating the amount of money. Now inflation means the CPI. If we give governments the ability to print money when there's emergencies, they're going to make up emergencies. As soon as the search engine, um, as those came, it was just like, oh, actually, this is cool. But That's, it's, the search engine moment was a little bit like with AI and ChatGPT, I feel like. Mm -hmm. Like with ChatGPT, a lot of people all, all of a sudden like kind of imagined, oh, like it's actually like really good and it's actually, we can do something with that because it made it so interactable, like it made it uh, real. And before it was like, oh yeah, there's AI, but it's just like weird totally. uh, hype words that companies use to charge a premium. And that was like kind of the perception before that. Uh, and now it's like, oh yeah, like <laughs> I I use ChatGPT now every day, at least like mm -hmm. three times for the podcast and all the things. Like I use ChatGPT so much, it it's kind of frightens me to be honest. I don't, I, I almost not Google anymore. Like uh, Googling right. is like maybe once a day and ChatGPT is like, I only have, a, I also have a lot of small GPTs written for myself that mm -hmm. do some tasks uh, in the podcast process yeah. uh, and just processing uh, text and finding tags and finding summaries and finding timestamps in a lot of things, even like in questions, it, it assists me because I just can give him the name and it's like, okay, what are the 10 most controversial opinions? What are the 10 most interesting topics that he discussed? What are like some podcasts we, he won on and what? And it's just like one prompt, I just give the name and I have like three pages of information and I didn't have to search for that. That's crazy. And, that, that's so, really cool. I love that type of stuff. Uh, this stuff is going to revolutionize. And it's going to it's gonna allow the fiat games to continue. Oh, you're saying that the that AI is uh, continuing the uh, fiat games. I mean, I guess uh, we can already jump into the podcast. Uh, I usually have a, a quite casual jump in anyways. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you're saying that AI is um, enhancing the, the fiat game and never thought about that. Yeah, well, it's uh, it's just another wave of positive productivity that is going to allow them to um, to steal more without it actually biting you in terms of like too much like actual inflation, right? It's the Jeff Booth argument of um, you're not, you know, you're you're just counting from zero. You're not thinking about the productivity gains that would have accrued to you if the money was hard. And so I, I think this is another thing that's going to be able to save them a little bit and uh, allow the the music to keep playing for longer. You know, personal computers already did this for them. And um, I think AI is going to do the same exact thing. It's an interesting thought because um, just when I think about my own podcast, I simply could not do a daily Bitcoin podcast without the AI tools. That like mm -hmm. it's it's impossible for me if you strip away the AI tools that I use currently yeah. uh, and thinking about doing the podcast in the same quality, yeah. the same quantity, it's just not possible at that point. Yeah, exactly. You're like a three man operation right now or more. And, and so like your productivity is just like ridiculous compared to what you could be even three years ago, which is something to think about. 
and, and it's going to hit unevenly. It's going to hit some areas uh, more than others, but but yeah, it's uh, it. I think it's going to it's going to raise productivity across society quite a bit. And but instead of getting lower prices. We're just going to get more money printing. I guess so too. And this point of like, we're not starting off zero. That's from Jeff Booth. It's, it's such a easy thing to say, but it's also a fundamental shift that you have to do in your own head. And I think sometimes we are still in this, this fiat mindset, even though we are talking about Bitcoin all day long. Uh, and it's like, what would the deflation be when we would not have, uh, mining this, this fiat, mm -hmm. uh, printing, uh, I didn't even know the name. Uh, this this whole money printing game. If we would not have that, we would have crazy productivity gains, and everything would always be falling. So, mm -hmm. and the the one thing that I come back is like you can now already see the Bitcoiners who adopt the Bitcoin standard. For them, it inflation is already your friend and not your enemy. Mm -hmm. Like it's, 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 it's crazy when we are now adopting a Bitcoin standard, because I want to talk later with you about that 2050 vision. Mm -hmm. Um, but you can, uh, put the 2050 vision already on your life right now and, and go on a Bitcoin standard. Totally. Uh, uh, and if you move to certain parts of the world, maybe you can actually live in, in a, in a Bitcoin standard with, with, uh, paying for things like yep. Switzerland or Lugano or something like that. Um, but it's already possible and it's, it's fascinating to see, uh, that, uh, the, the rest of the world will be so left behind of all the possible, um, uh, purchasing power gains they could make if they factor in the, the, the financial system, their own financial standard would be Bitcoin. And then mm -hmm. maybe they use like tools like AI and, and something like to enhance the productivity that that's like a seems like a cheat code. <laughs> I know. And, and, uh, it's, I think it's gonna, it's gonna, uh, enable some productivity growth in, uh, places where Westerners are going to consider it quite unexpected, even though it really shouldn't be unexpected. I think we're going to get some insane productivity growth coming out of Africa, Southeast Asia, um, South America, uh, because people there, like you said, you don't have to wait for your government. You just do it. Uh, you can get on a Bitcoin standard for most of your store value. Uh, you don't have to do it for all your monetary needs. I mean, I, you know, their money does different things. And, you know, some people are very, they're very dead set on a type of money doing all the money things, right? It has to do the medium of exchange bit, the store value bit, and the unit of account bit. And I, I just, I, I'm, I don't think like that. Uh, I, I think there's moneyness to many different types of goods, and different types of goods can fulfill different roles that uh, a money uh, should do. And and so I, I, you know, I've never been anywhere in the world where I've had any problem paying for anything like a small thing, like at the corner shop or whatever. Everyone has some like crappy fiat money to do that. That's not a problem for people. It's saving money and building capital over time without having it stolen from you by the government. That's the problem. That's what what's holding a lot of these people back. Um, now that they have access to computers, they have access to AI, it's not that expensive and they can get on, you know, a hard money standard. It's like Nico said, he was like, okay, imagine the whole world on like the Deutsche Mark and I mean, I'm, I'm stealing that. That is a brilliant way of thinking about it. Um, I, I think, you know, a lot of these areas are just going to leapfrog. They're just going to go, you know, they're, they're not even going to care what the government says. They're just going to go uh, use the hardest money that they can for saving. Uh, and it's going to impact them positively. And other people can't help but be impacted by that as well. So I, I think that's a trend that we're going to see. We're going to see tremendous growth, uh, especially in proportional terms, come out of uh, emerging markets from this. Digital services, software production, these types of things, like you can do that anywhere. Uh, you know, now with, with the help of these like AI agents, you can get so much more work done as a single person. And if you can get paid and you can save, that's like a tremendous opportunity for raising living standards in a lot of places. I think it's going to happen. 
Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating to, to even think about that. And uh, there's also like my, my first actual topic that I want to discuss with you today. Um, when we already see now the, the, the trend towards Bitcoin and trend towards those, uh, those things, um, how, and we will speak in, in a few days, probably like really close to, to when I publish that will be Bitcoin Amsterdam, where we, we are on, on stage with Pram and uh, Evan, uh, talking about a hyper Bitcoinized world in, in 2050 and how a life in 2050 uh, in that Bitcoin world uh, would be and what things would change. And we already talked before how how difficult that topic and that question is because it looks out 26 years. Uh, it's like looking back at the internet when it's 1998 and you want to predict what's happening in 2024. Um, but uh, let's try to do our best job anyways. Um, how do you imagine that Bitcoin world, if Bitcoin under the presumption that Bitcoin is actually successful and it goes how we want it to go uh, mm -hmm. in 2050? First of all, like how do you think look does that look like for you? And then how does the world look like if, if Bitcoin is successful? If Bitcoin is properly successful, I think it can dramatically change the world in a lot of ways. It, it can be as profound as like, you know, think about how profound remote working is. And, and just the fact that you and me are sitting here in a digital studio over the internet, like doing TV stuff with, you know, I have like a 500 pound setup here and, you know, you probably have something similar and it, we're doing stuff that is not far from equivalent in quality to what a, like, you know, million dollar TV studio would get you 30 years ago. Uh, or even 20 years ago. I mean, I, actually, our camera quality is probably higher than what they had. Um, so I, I just think the, the, the possibility of profound change uh, to, to a point that is hard to comprehend uh, could happen. Uh, I mean, we could, we could start, if, if we start like from the top, um, so I'm, I'm very much of the... Um, um, of the sovereign individual school where I think that uh, changes in technology drive megapolitical events. And, you know, Safe talks a lot about this when he says something to the tune of, um, you can choose not to use gunpowder, but you can't choose to insulate yourself from the effects on you of other people using gunpowder. And so I, I think Bitcoin is very similar to that in, in, in that it, you, you have to use it um, at a certain point, because if you don't, you're going to fall so far behind that life just becomes like untenable. And so the, the, there comes there comes kind of like a tipping point where everyone has to start thinking very seriously about this and doing it. And so the, the largest, the, the biggest effect that I think this is going to have is that if you if you look at it from the largest possible picture, um, the biggest thing that Bitcoin does is that it tilts uh, return on investment from aggression back. So today, uh, aggression is fairly well rewarded. Uh, you, you can view this in another way. It's like the balance between offensive and defensive technologies. Right? So if you go back to uh, if you perfect example from the sovereign in individual is how the political situation of Europe changed once city walls were invented. So before this point, uh, raiding was quite profitable. You know, you, you created a raiding party, you took somebody by surprise, you like raided and looted their city and you made a bunch of money. Then city walls, uh, and, and so in that type of environment, there's there are only a, a few type of political structures that kind of make sense. Uh, normally, you know, you have a very like top down uh, structure normally driven by warlords or, you know, people who are like the warrior type, uh, they're, they're going to like protect you or help you raid or do something like this. Then on, on, onto the scene comes the, uh, the technology of building city walls. And what happens? Well, the balance of power shifts back in favor of the defender again. And so, no longer is it that attractive to loot. And so the whole political scene, uh, especially in the Southern Mediterranean, changes. 
And so city, uh, you know, city states pop up, you get these like polities all of a sudden inside of the city wall, it makes a lot more sense to trade and build and create things than it, than it does to go and, you know, pillage and steal by force. And, you know, humans are all about incentives. If it's more profitable to go and take other people's stuff by force, then some people are going to do that. A lot of people are going to do that. If it's more profitable to build things and create and trade peacefully, uh, because the return on investment on violence is low, then you get civilization, you get like complex societal structures, you get specialization in the economy, you know, you get productivity growth, you, you basically you get what modern society is built on, which is we're actually pretty efficient at doing different things because we can specialize, you know, not everyone has to be a warrior to protect their family. Uh, we, we can have some reasonable assurance that we're not going to be like just looted out of our possessions at any given point. And so one of the main things that I think Bitcoin does is that it tilts, um, it tilts the opportunity or it, it tilts the advantage back towards defense again. Uh, Bitcoin is very defensible. It's easy to protect. It's hard to steal. And I think this in general um, makes looting that type of uh of life just less interesting, less profitable. The return on investment for violence goes down. And so I think we're going to have a less violent society. Less violent society normally tends to mean greater things um, civilizationally. Uh, you know, it, it, it literally lowers people's time preference, literally. Uh, when, when, when you can be reasonably assured that no one's going to come take your stuff, you think further ahead. Uh, you have the ability to, you know, un uncertainty is one of the key negative influences on civilization. If you have a level of uncertainty that is prohibitive to do long-term stuff, then long-term stuff just isn't done. And then nothing is really that nice. So I think that's like the biggest effect. Um, the, the second largest effect is that the existence of Bitcoin kind of forces fiscal responsibility on on everyone, uh, but states in particular, uh, because they've previously had the privilege to, you know, print money as they choose and the citizenry has to pick up the bill. Uh, if the citizenry has access to Bitcoin, that is you're just limiting the set of people who you can steal from because you can only really steal from people who don't have Bitcoin because otherwise Bitcoin just reprices to reflect a new uh, amount of money uh, in, in the trading pair that you've just inflated. So when you can't do that, um, that too, I think, really diminishes the return on, on violence. It just becomes very expensive to maintain these gigantic militaries that go around and, you know, loot resources on massive scales, you know, think like Iraq, Libya, you know, th these types of operations where they just go in and, you know, take over the whole like commodity production resource base of like a giant country. I just think this will become harder and harder uh, because you literally have to go to the citizenry and say, hey, I want to build, you know, like a giant army to go steal stuff like are you guys going to be okay with some more taxes and everyone's going to say no <laughs> definitely not <laughs> we don't want to do that like <laughs> can't we all be friends um and so you know that i i think it's going to make it basically makes empires less profitable and so i think states are going to shrink i think you might see the breakup of some of the like very very large uh super multicultural countries with low social cohesion. Um, and so I think you're actually going to have a lot more countries by 2015. That's, that's one of my, I, I personally think and hope that we will uh, return towards something that's mo more closely like medieval Europe with uh, lots of independent polities, lots of smaller independent states that band together in federations. Uh, and federations are uh, some of the most uh, resilient political structures over time as well. Some of the oldest countries in the world are federations. And so those are like the large, the very, very like large scale things that I see. I see less war, smaller countries, uh, less military, more fiscal responsibility and more long term thinking. And so I think we're going to build cooler stuff.
bigger stuff, cooler stuff, prettier stuff. This whole Bitcoiner obsession about architecture is is absolutely, um, I think it's true. Uh, I, I think once we are forced into, or not forced into, once we are uh, given the ability again to think longer term, um, I think we're going to return to building nicer stuff. And I actually can't wait for that. Um, so absolutely a little drab lately. Absolutely. I, I love that a lot. And kind of the summary of that for me, what I took away is like it, Bitcoin gives you the incentive to provide value and not to cheat. Yeah. Uh, and in that is it disincentivizes uh, not to cheat, not to steal from someone else, not to to burn other building stones, but to build a really nice building yourself mm -hmm. uh, and to, to make uh, things better. And also like a little bit of a return to quality, a return to uh, those uh, low time preference things, which uh, I think if, if that's, that's the outcome of Bitcoin, that alone has such a uh, positive effect on everyone, even if he doesn't own Bitcoin. <laughs> that, that's yeah. the main thing. It makes the world better, even for the people to done, who don't earn bit, own Bitcoin, even though they should own Bitcoin. Uh, but but that, that's, a, that's a big thing, uh, I, I feel like. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I, the, I, I just wish everybody would have some because I, I do think, uh, I don't think um, fiat monies are going away anytime soon. I think they're going to keep at it for as long as they possibly can. If, if, if you're not protecting yourself, will be, they will squeeze you until the end they will sque squeeze you until there's nothing more to squeeze so i you know i would obviously prefer if uh if more people would s start i mean like, like you said you don't have to wait you can just do it now um yes you're gonna have to tolerate some volatility is volatility worse than just having a constant hand in your pocket taking out your money um in a compounding way that's another thing that I don't think people like fully appreciate that the theft that comes from inflation compounds. And so the amount of money that has been stolen from you at the, at the midpoint or the end of your career starts just becoming absolutely stupendous. Um, and the, the amount of wealth, even the most like the regular person could have the amount of additional wealth a regular person could have it's just crazy well, one thing that you quickly uh like briefly mentioned before is taxes uh once we don't have a money printer at the state and the nation states or whatever the jurisdictional form that uh, people will uh, gather themselves <laughs> in, in in 2050 um they actually have to ask the citizens Mm -hmm. for the money so they have to uh can only spend the money that they actually have because there is no money printer that can just be turned on if there is a emergency uh, uh which is uh, <laughs> seemingly every few years an emergency to print money and even in between we print a little bit of money so uh, there's always an excuse for printing money what happens if that possibility is no longer there and they have to ask for taxes for everything. Are we switching to a, a service-based uh, model? It's like the, the vision of the sovereign individual uh, then already in play in 2050, or is that too quick? I think some places. Uh, I, th I think there will just be more choice, which I think what, what freedom fundamentally is, is, ch is choice, just the ability to choose yourself uh, without somebody else imposing choices on you. Uh, so I think we will have more freedom and more choice I don't think governments are going to go away. I think the model of the welfare state is actually quite popular. Uh, and I think a lot of people want that. Um, and uh, I, I think having that, uh, if you agree to it and you think it's fine, I don't see a problem. I mean, it's uh, it's probably not the most efficient way to, to generate wealth. Um, but so long as we have... So long as people are actually free to move about and choose uh, and vote with their feet, if you will, for which system they want to be a part of. And so long as 
it's clear to everyone uh, which systems, which political systems deliver the most, the highest standard of life to people. Um, and, and moving costs are low, switching costs are low. Uh, I, I think we will arrive naturally at um, where, where we're going to be. I think some places are going to be just like we have now. Some places are going to be higher tax. Some places are going to be lower tax. It, it's just it's going to depend on a ton of factors. I don't I don't foresee a ton of different difference there i think i mean what i what i first hope for is a change in the conversation and i think that probably will happen because obviously inflation uh inflation taxes are undemocratic uh because we don't get to choose when they're uh, put on us and most people don't even know that that's what that is they just see the prices go up and they think that's like the way it's it has to be they don't even know that they're being taxed um, and it's not even like all that tax is going to the government. Uh, a, a lot of the inflation tax, if you will, on regular people are just going to large private entities who can take out the most debt. The first thing I would want, and I do think we're going to get this increasingly on a Bitcoin standard, is that there's going to be a change in conversation and hopefully a more higher awareness among regular people, like what is actually happening uh, and wh why their prices just always go up. Like, why is that? Uh, I mean, if you asked a person that question 10 years ago, probably 99 out of 100 would have no idea. They just would have absolutely no, no idea why why that's taking place. If you ask now, I think there's like a growing awareness. Maybe uh, only 90 out of 100 will be unable to tell you and maybe 10 people will actually be able to tell you. I mean, that's that's quite a growth in um, in awareness. And, and this type of, aware, of awareness, I think, is just driven on by the existence of Bitcoin and the fact that it works and what I think will become very hard to ignore evidence over time, which is that countries that adopt the Bitcoin standard should do better. Um, and I think people are going to have a really hard time denying that. It, it's just going to be obvious. And so that, that I think is going to lead to more competition. I think you'll have more and more countries, especially small countries, uh, doing Bitcoin standard stuff, doing like lower taxes, uh, you know, trying to trying to uh, get growth be the primary like motor of their economy and just like have their uh, their prosperity come from, the, you know, regular people's ability to actually build capital. So, yeah, I, I don't like. I, I do think we we will end up at a point where you might have sovereign individuals. Uh, for sure, because some some states are going to become service based. Um, I mean, it's almost already like that in some places. So I don't see why that wouldn't become more prevalent. Um, and then you have these like package deals. It's, it, it's like, what do you want? Do you want an all inclusive state? Like, do you want all your all inclusive? <laughs> like, or, or, or do you want to like pick and choose? And like some people are holiday people. And they like the all-inclusive stuff. Uh, other people are the traveler type, and they're like, eh, I'll, I'll, I'll pick and choose my own things. I, you know, to me, the most important thing is that there's choice. I don't think like, I don't think uh, one solution is good for everyone. Uh, for some people, the all-inclusive like welfare state model is probably really good. Uh, and so long as they can attract enough people. Uh, of the higher productivity type to kind of like help along the ones that are of the lower productivity type, then should be okay, no? But 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 well, is that sustainable? I don't know. I, I really don't know uh, because if if you get to a point where all the productive people uh, pick up and and go where their service provision is the best, then that's going to be a real problem for welfare states. It will be a, a game theory event where basically the countries are kind of forced to make themselves smaller and more service-based in the long run anyways. It's a really interesting thought uh, if, if Bitcoin mm -hmm. prevails, how how nation states and, and, and those borders and those all those laws that are now into place uh, actually uh, come into place. Also, one thing that I really want to get into a little bit with you is the awareness for inflation, as you said, like uh, there, there are more and more, there's more and more awareness for inflation. I have no clue how it was like 10, 15 years ago uh, because it was just not a topic back then. And I was like 
12 years old. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, now I see that the inflation topic is in everyone's mind. Like people actually talk about inflation when I sit on a train and I listen to a conversation like a few rows in front of me or I'm at the restaurant and I overhear other tables, like inflation, that things are getting more expensive. That's a topic. It's also a political topic because uh, we had yesterday a national election in Austria. It was a big, big topic also there. So it's 100% a topic. And that probably was 10 years ago, not true. Mm -hmm. But interesting enough, I never hear the real reason for inflation. Like (laughs) when I, when I, when I hear people talking about it, when you hear mainstream media's political, political, uh, people, but also on the streets, on, on buses or something like that, you hear greedy, immigra- uh, greedy corporations, immigrants, you hear war. You, you remember, do you remember that one article where they blamed Beyonce for, for inflation? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so it, that, it was, yeah, I mean, it's, it's partly by design, right? Um, there, are, there are definitely some people who, who have very vested interest in obfuscation here. But I think... A lot of the rest of it is just incentives. Um, I just don't think academia really is incentivized to figure out why this is true. People still have this like knee-jerk trust of like experts or whatever. So if like some professor goes on the television and says, oh, we don't really know what's causing inflation. And everyone's like, well, I guess it's a mystery then, right? <laughs> no. And I, I think uh, a lot of people don't have the... <laughs> they just don't have the the confidence in themselves to believe that they're actually capable of figuring this out. And it's not even that complicated, uh, but because they just assume that, well, it's a very complex and intricate topic. And like, if this professor guy can't figure it out, that I mean, I stand no chance and I might not even try. Uh, and it's not common. Uh, like the, the, the writers that they need to read, uh, the the kind of economics thinkers that have known this for hundreds of years are just not that commonly known. Uh, they're they're very rarely uh, made curriculum in uh, economics education. I mean, I know a bunch of people who've gone to school for economics, and I mean, a lot of them are like. You know, we not not only did we not learn the correct stuff, they taught us the wrong stuff, and so it's just you know it's it's difficult. I just think it's it's difficult for people to get. You know, I, I think a lot of people are trying. I think the media are trying. They're just not capable. Uh, I mean, and it's hard being the media. Like, think about all the stuff you got to be an expert in to like deliver like good meat, like good journalism, and and there are so few of them now. You know, back in the day. Like a newspaper would have, you know, a ton of journalists. Now they have like a small handful and they all have to be experts on like 12 different things. And so nothing they do is particularly good. And then, you know, people are just not well informed. Uh, and, you know, I, I think I, I, honestly, like what you're doing is a, is a reaction to this, right? It's like, you know, how do we how do we get like the real information to people and, and the democratization of, <clears throat> of information creation and. Uh, and media, I think, is is going to be uh, hugely positive here. It's like we literally need to go. Uh, there are enough people who know how this works. Like it's not that hard. Uh, but yeah, it, we it, we just need to get the information out there. Um, and and you know, once you see, it, it's obvious. It's like, well, okay, you change the denominator, then yeah, the price changes. I mean, <laughs> obviously. Um, but you know, people. Even the word itself, like if you think about how well obfuscated this is, you know, and I don't know if it's on purpose entirely or not, but if you think about how well obfuscated it is, inflation right now uh, doesn't mean the increase of the money supply uh, the way the way it used to. Like that that used to be what that word meant. It's like it, it, think about the word you inflate something. What are you inflating? You're inflating the amount of money. Like that is how the the word used to be. Uh, that was the semantic content of the word. Now, inflation means the CPI, like the consumer price index. That is what inflation is now. So it's hard to even have a good conversation about this because if, before you have a good conversation, you have to sit down and like, 
you have to agree on terms. It's like, okay, when we say inflation, now, what is it that we mean? Do we mean the the increase in the in the basket of goods, the price increase? Is that what you mean by inflation? Like, why is that going up? Well, it's because of inflation. <laughs> and, and then they're like, yeah, but sometimes they print money and prices don't go up. And then you really have to go there. You know, you have to talk about productivity increases and natural deflation and like free markets and all of this stuff. And then a lot of them will dismiss you because they'll be like, oh, that's right wingery right there. You know, now nah, this is right wing stuff and we don't want to hear that. Uh, so a lot of conversations just die right there as well. I mean, and, and if you don't want to know, then you don't want to know. And the other thing about modern politics is that if something can be really, really vague, you know, everybody likes a boogeyman or an enemy in modern politics. And if you can make inflation your enemy, but you can make inflation so difficult to pin down that nobody knows what it is or how it exists, then you can use that politically to do a lot of stuff, right? Because you can be like, uh, I'm going to do this and it's going gonna, it's gonna to lower inflation, right? And then people are going to be like, okay, yeah, you know, that's probably true. Like, look at the, the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act, you know? They're like, we're going to print a ton of money and we're going to use it to lower inflation. <laughs> and people just went like, yeah, yes, that is exactly what we need right now. And it says in the bill, the bill is named the Inflation Reduction Act. So that's obviously what they're going for. And listen, inflation is so hard anyway and so complicated. No one even knows where it comes from. But these guys, like, they probably know what they're doing. And they really want our, they have our best in mind. So, like, here's where we're going to take that. So it's really politically useful, too, for this to be poorly defined, not really, like, dealt with in the 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 depth that you kind of expect expect from public officials like they don't want that they that's that doesn't help them they need something to be like i am for this and i'm going to get your prices down and i'm going to do it by implementing my political ideology and that's going to work i'm going to i'm going to do rent control or like price fixing or whatever it is because that is what you want to hear because you are a left leaning person and so that's going to get me reelected and I'm going to 100% do that and it's going to work. And when it doesn't, you're going to be like, okay, but that wasn't my fault. And if you just elect me again, it'll work next time. Right. And this is like how they go. This is how it goes over and over and over. So, uh, yeah, the, the public conversation. So, you know, just back to the original point, I think the public conversation is getting a little bit better. Uh, because like you said, 10 years ago, yeah, you, maybe you're too young. I still remember uh, people sort of talked about it, but not really because inflation wasn't that bad. Even after all that money was printed in the wake of the great financial crisis and the euro crisis and all that, then inflation never really hit. And honestly, that did a lot of damage to the uh, money printing creates inflation narrative, which is quite interesting, too. So I, I think a lot of people looked at that and they were like, yeah, but they printed all this money back then. And look, that didn't create any inflation, right? But then it's the Jeff Booth thing. It's like, yeah, measured against what though? Measured against like the productivity growth? Uh, you know, yeah, prices didn't go up, but it's because we actually were in the middle of the IT revolution. And we were in the middle of the outsourcing everything to China wave. So everything got cheaper, right? But instead of everything getting cheaper, it just stayed around zero and all that money printing it went to the governments and to the uh you know the the large corporations and the large institutions able to take on uh you know in, increasing amount of debts so yeah it's it's getting better i would say it's getting better like at least now we're talking about it again obviously it's sad because everybody had to get like wrecked for that to happen but the conversation is now back on the table uh, and I, there are more people now, bec partly because of Bitcoin, there are more people now who actually understand what's going on here. And they're like, oh, yeah, because we're printing a ton of money. It's obvious, right? That was not the case even 10 years ago, like at all. There's only gold bugs who talked about that, and they were seen as totally crazy. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep 
the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for a hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your Bitbox. And the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual. You have to have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made an perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. Make sure to check out the link in the description for this amazing Coin Vigilante timepieces. Those watches are amazing. I love them so much. It was really hard for me to pick the one that I want to have because there are a lot of great options. I went with the new transparency edition. They are all limited. Limited. So grab yours. Those will not be available for a long time, but there will come new models and new amazing designs along the way. That's so interesting. Uh, like, I, I love that point. Like there is, uh, by the way, a lot of things that, <laughs> that I want to unpack here. Um, yep. uh, the one thing that came up in my mind is also like, where when you hear the, the mainstream media and, and, and some, some news articles were like, oh yeah, Bitcoin failed as an inflation hedge because there was like 5% inflation and then one month and in that very month, Bitcoin went down like 1%. But so that's obviously like, that's proof that then Bitcoin failed as an inflation hedge. And I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> is is that, that, that the level we are at right now? And, it, and it's fascinating for me uh, uh, when, when we think about uh, Bitcoin as an uh, in inflation hedge, because it absolutely is, but people zoom in too much. And mm -hmm. I have one amazing graphic that I discovered not that long ago. And uh, you probably know that. I, I will just like share it quickly because I heard it. Uh, it, it was so, so such an amazing uh, graphic. Uh, let me quickly bring it up and let me get your thoughts on it. That is, uh, do you see it? Yeah, you see it. Uh, that is the oh, yeah. four, four year simple moving average of the Bitcoin price. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's, and, on, a, and that's on, on a linear scale. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and that's, the, that's the thing where I'm like, um, the only thing you have to do with Bitcoin is moving out of your, you're too zoomed in, you are too fixated on like a daily move or like even a monthly move or something like that. And just like focus long-term, uh, know that that is an inflation hedge, but not for tomorrow. Like, like <laughs> if tomorrow your, uh, I don't know, banana is five cents higher, that doesn't mean that Bitcoin could not go down. Like that, that does, that's not a, a thing. Like inflation is a very, but it, it is in, 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 in general terms, a quite complicated process where when they print a bunch of money it's not like it all uh, comes directly into the economy it me it needs some time so there's some lag uh, in there and also for the inflation hedge of, of bitcoin uh, it's such a small um, uh, asset right now compared to like gold real estate and all the other markets mm -hmm. where uh, it's not only an inflation hedge but it's also a fast growing uh, tech startup in, in in a way because it's still so small, uh, and I think that's a lot of the confusion uh, is, is where a lot of the confusion is coming from. And I just wanted to, to bring this up because I think it it suits very nicely to, to the conversation. Totally, and but, but you know, so 
you're just a start. People are very bad at thinking long term, just in general. And this is this is a part of a result of the of the fiat mindset. But but you know the other thing too is that uh, your money printing doesn't necessarily have to create inflation there and then. It depends on like where the money is going. So two thousand eight is like a perfect example. Like the money was already in that it already caused the inflation at that point, right? Because all of these like balance sheets had been tapped already. That money had gone out as bonuses and as, you know, salaries and as like that had been extracted already. And so all of that, you know, everything was hollowed out. And when, when things collapsed and they printed all the money, they just reinflated the balance sheet. So they just gave back the stuff that had already been taken out. And then when people didn't take that back out again immediately, yeah, of course, there was not like that much pressure on the prices. Um, you know, that, that money was already out. Uh, it, it had caused the, the, the upwards price on uh, uh, the upwards pressure on prices in the years leading up to that point. And you could see it, the, you know, the, uh, the, the stock markets were already, you know, at like what were considered nosebleeds high <laughs> at that point. And so that, that, that had already happened. So it, it shouldn't be that surprising to people, but it, but it is because people don't like doing the work. But yeah, the, you know, zooming out and, and thinking about inflation as a, and again, it comes back to people don't have the right semantic content to, you know, built into the, their understanding of the word inflation. Like when they think inflation, yeah, they just think price is going up day to day. Uh, they're not thinking about the long-term effects of monetary debasement and what that does over time on prices because people just aren't very good at zooming out. Uh, everyone's like, and, and, you know, everyone's on the fiat treadmill, right? Like everyone has to constantly just work to keep afloat. Where's everyone going to get the time to just like sit down and like think deeply about this? This is why I, th I just think Bitcoin comes very naturally to people who are extremely curious and you can't help it. You have to read about this stuff. It's like you're scratching an itch or something, you know, um, th those people are, are the ones that always just get Bitcoin quicker because they're already out there trying to figure out how, how the world works, you know, the, you know, even if they are in like the fiat treadmill, they just, they just can't help it. That's just who they are and they have to figure out things. How, how can we expect everyone to, to kind of be at that level? I just don't think it's, it's, it's realistic. Like even four years is very hard for people. I mean, I, I know a bunch of people who don't even like save for their pension. They're just like, Oh, it's going to sort itself out. Like it's, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it won't. And then they're like, yeah, whatever. That's like 40 years from now. Um, and that, you know, I, it's, it, but, but it is known though, that stress in your, in your day-to-day -day life uh, just generates an inability for you to plan for the future. Uh, and, and, and this is a poverty creating mindset as well, you know? So, and, and, and trauma actually does that to people. Um, and so w whenever there's a world full of trauma, you know, there's wars here and like terrorist attacks there and, you know, this, that and the other is always something, you know, you, you spoke earlier about you know, there's always this emergency money, money printing, right? Well, yeah, if, if, we, if we give governments the ability to print money when there's emergencies, they're going to make up emergencies. Like, like people work on incentives that, I mean... It, it sounds so like one point, like uh, on one side, it sounds like mundane. It, it's just like, well, yeah, obviously. But then on the other side, it's like, no, people would never do that. Like, you know, they're good people and like this and the other. It's just like incentives. You, you give someone the incentive to do something, someone's going to do it. Someone's going to do it. Not everyone's going to do it. But like there are all sorts of people that come through government. Some are good, some are bad. The bad people are going to do it. They're going to, they're absolutely going to do it. Like you, you give them the opportunity to do something that enriches themselves at the expense of everybody else. Like, yeah, someone's going to do that. 100%. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's so clear. It's like that in, in that incentive problem, uh, is by the way, also my main argument always against uh, CBDCs. 
um, mm-hmm. because a lot of people are like, oh, you're, you're like right wing, you you don't like governments. And I'm like, no, like even if we assume that everyone involved right now with CBDCs is an angel and they really just want the best for everyone mm-hmm. uh, and uh, they, they just want to have the best currency and they just really try to build it. Even yeah. if that's true, they still install a tool which uh, can be programmable, be, can be abused, and it's just a matter of time till the right One person comes happens. and will abuse that tool. So that that's like, uh, if, if if we install that tool, <laughs> it will be abused at some point. Uh, absolutely, and you know, I I always tell people wh- whenever I hear this argument, like I uh, I always say like, don't give the government a tool if you wouldn't be happy. Uh, for that tool to be in the hands of Hitler or Stalin. Like, don't give anyone a tool if you wouldn't be happy with those people having that tool. Just don't make the tool. Don't, don't just, we don't need that tool. Uh, and, and in the US right now, it's just like, because a lot of people, you know, see Trump as, as like that level dangerous. And I'm just like, you know, uh, so, you know, your candidate is, is in, uh, is in um, power right now. And they want all this like, new tools and these powers. I'm like, have you literally forgotten what things were like, like three years ago? Like, how would you feel with this candidate having that toolkit? It's like, just don't do it. Like they don't, they don't need the tool. If they don't already have the tool, there's probably also a good reason for that. Like, so why, 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 why do they need this tool? Don't give it to them. They're, someone's going to abuse it. Some bad person is always going to come along you know, even just even some of the worst people ever were elected, you know, they don't need the tool. But they have to fix inflation and we need CBDCs for inflation fixing. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. That's um, unfortunately what, what they're actually saying. Like that's, that's so, um, it, it's sad in, in, in a way. But it opens up my uh, one question that I had uh, kind of from the beginning uh, when we talk about how Bitcoin will look like, we have on the one side that feared monetary system that mm-hmm. is debasing no matter what. Like, I think there's no way around that they will not debase. The, the, the rate of debasement and the, how fast they will print money, it's mm-hmm. different. But <laughs> at the end of the day, they will find some emergency and they will print money. And if, even if we find some way where there's 20 years of no emergencies, they still will print money and the money will still be debased. The currency mm-hmm. will still be debased. And then on the other side, we have now Bitcoin, an alternative and digital alternative, which is really getting with every day better to use, easier to use. There are more on ramps. There are, there's just like so much development right now in Bitcoin, where it's mm-hmm. like if you're not there uh, a year, you feel like you, you <laughs> slept like five years, yeah. uh, which is kind of amazing to see. Even just like the last year, that's what this having. There was the Bitcoin ETFs. There was so much happening. Um, do you see any chance of the, the fiat monetary system, so basically government having their own currency long term um, uh, surviving if we have that exit valve where people can really easily switch there and there's already such a big portion there, not as such, mm-hmm. like it's pretty uh, few people actually there, but uh, it's, it's already for the 15 years only existing, uh, quite impressive. Um, do you see any chance no matter the the time frame of it, but do you see any chance that fiat actually always is there as governments want to have their own tokens? They're always going to want to have it, right? Uh, so I I think it's it's going to probably be with us for a really long time. But uh, if 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 those fiat currencies are you know quote unquote backed with like something real like gold or Bitcoin or, you know, something like that. And, you know, they, they can still do their whole like legal, legal tender enforcement and like this, that, and the other. And like we said earlier, not everyone cares. And if they're fine uh, and if they don't see much damage and, and if, if money printing really, really starts slowing down because Bitcoin uh, forces fiscal responsibility on governments, then fiat money has become a lot less problematic. It just becomes more of like a censorship tool and like that type of stuff. Um, and if it's like super easy to use and, you know, this, that, and you have to pay your taxes, okay, maybe, maybe it'll be there. I don't know. Long, long term, though, it just seems pointless. Like, like long, long term, it's just like, why? What does it do? Uh, 
you know, it's one thing when, when, when you had to build paper on top of gold because gold was really hard to move. Um, and I mean, you can make a, you can make an argument that uh, government fiat is just going to become a Bitcoin L2. And I mean, maybe that's how it goes. So maybe on-chain transactions uh, are going to get like ridiculously expensive and, and heavy. Uh, and it requires like big, big economic density to do an on-chain settlement, maybe. Uh, if that is the case, then yeah, maybe there's a case for uh, government fiat monies being L2s. Uh, but they have to have reserves and, you know, you can you can check that and it's got to be auditable and blah, blah, blah. Maybe. Um, I... All I know is that they're going to try for as long as they can to keep that thing going. Like, bureau, like bureaucracies are, they're like stubborn. It's really hard to kill them. They're like cockroaches, you know, they'll, they'll find something. Uh, they'll find something for themselves to do. Uh, but yeah, like long, long term, I just like, what, what, like, what is the point? Because like this thing is electronically movable. Uh, and, and even if you do uh, L2 stuff in a centralized way, like, I just feel like it would be better for private companies to do the currency issuance. Um, I just think they're more likely to do it well. Over time, I think financial censorship is just going to become like untenable anyway. Uh, th that's like my optimistic scenario is that cryptography just like over time and technology just makes that, that can't be done. Like you could try, but if people want to, it's, it's kind of even like that today. Like if you really want to, you can kind of do whatever you want on the internet. Uh, it's just hard. You got to put like, it's like a barrier you have to. So, you know, most people aren't even going to do that. I think most people are honest and are, you know, they're going to pay their taxes. They're going to do their thing. They're not going to launder money or <laughs> type of stuff. Like normal people don't do that unless you'd like, tax the crap out of them and they're just like I don't like this then yeah maybe you force them into something like but yeah I long term I just don't see the point in fiat um like long long term like but I don't I don't know that I'll live to see the end of fiat money I, I think maybe that'll just be with, with us for a while um but but not in its current shape or form like I just I what I do think is that just Bitcoin takes away their ability to debase willy-nilly. They just can't do it because no matter what they do, the Bitcoin price just shifts. It, it reflects the new debasement, right? You know, you print 10% more money, immediately Bitcoin price should change 10% if it's known that you print it. Uh, and if it's not known, then a lot of people are using a, a money that's not verifiable. And I just don't see that happening either because verifiability is so easy in Bitcoin. So... I just over time, people are going to be inherently suspicious of unverifiable uh, types of money. So, yeah, I, I think they're going to go away long, long term, but I think they'll be with us for quite some time. But, yeah, they'll probably just tokenize. Yeah, absolutely. Sort of, yeah, absolutely. either a CBDC or, or like a functioning. Yeah, uh, could, could be, could be. Uh, L2, like the whole nother uh, discussion. I. I will not open it as, as we already went one hour. Uh, it will, will be interesting how we can fit uh, three people, like basically four people in the panel in like half an hour. That will be probably a, a really... It's going to be very hard. Like, really yeah, hard. I've, <laughs> I've, uh, I, I've moderated <laughs> these things before. It's actually really difficult because, you know, you got to ask like really sharp pointed questions. And if you have people like me on who like ramble for like 20 minutes, then you got to figure out how to like... I will try can, to do my best. <laughs> maybe you can give us like a buzzer that we like put in our pocket and when we're rambling you're just going like a like a cattle prod or like one of those things that you put on your dog so that it doesn't go outside you mean of, an, like, an electric shock uh, so like, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah something like that Be like, oh, okay sorry <laughs> next person <laughs> I, I hope we at least see see our time that that would be that would be fine uh yeah. really cool um as we're coming to the end, uh, and one thing that I really want to get into with you, uh, you are part, as I saw it, from CoinShare, uh, mm -hmm. and CoinShare is offering a Bitcoin ETP, not an ETF, which I always was confused. What's the difference between an ETP and an ETF? First of all, like, what is the difference? And then maybe we can get into, because we had this, the Bitcoin ETF in the USA. Uh, yeah. Sometime. 
uh, the, uh, there's no difference, really. Uh, the only difference is that in Europe, you can't call it an ETF because in Europe, there are specific rules for what can be called an ETF. And an ETF needs to be a basket of different assets, uh, minimum 20% each. Uh, sorry, maximum 20% each. So um, uh, you, you can't make a single uh, asset ETF in Europe. So it's just called an ETP, but it's functionally identical to the to the U.S. ones. Actually, it's a little bit it's a little bit better because uh, we do creation and redemption in kind, whereas in the U.S. it's done in in cash. And so here, when we issue certificates, uh, we get Bitcoin sent to us directly. We issue the certificate, and then when certificates are redeemed we send the physical Bitcoin and you can, it's possible to physically redeem the Bitcoin uh, notes that you hold. So, uh, so it's, uh, it, it's, it's arguably a better structure and we've had it for quite some time. We, we had the first, the first uh, Bitcoin ETP uh, in Europe uh, started in 2015 and it's ours. Um, and, uh, but that, that wasn't structured that way. That was structured uh, by a swap. So it's, um, it's an inferior structure for the note holder. Whereas right now when it's physically backed, uh, there is um, like a, a swap based ETF is basically a debt instrument. It's a claim against the balance sheet of the, of the issuer. Now uh, there is a, a direct link of ownership from the certificate holder down to the Bitcoin at the custodian. So even if we go bankrupt, uh, and cease to exist as a company, the note holders, uh, they don't have any claims against us. They actually like own the Bitcoin that is held with the custodian. So it's just a superior product. Um, it, it, there's, there's really, for most people the, the, you know, who aren't securities lawyers and who don't care that much about like the very intricacies of the structure of these products, they're functionally identical. So, um, and, and there are a bunch of them here in Europe. And like I said, we've had them for a while. So, um, and, and they're, they're widely accessible uh, across European markets. They trade on exchanges in Germany and Switzerland and Netherlands and Sweden and I think France and uh, all over the place. So, well, Why do you think the, the Bitcoin ETF, like there was in Canada one, the, there was in, in Europe, there was a bunch that's all over the world, uh, Bitcoin ETFs or ETPs, however you call them. Um, and now that we have it in America, it kind of like was like, oh, it's the first Bitcoin ETF, but you know, it's, it's just the first in the U United States. Um, why is that so meaningful, the one in the US, or is that just blown over by the medias? And if it was that meaningful, uh, do you think that the impact of it uh, is real and uh, will it be um, even bigger in, in the coming years? So it, it's just because of the size of the U.S. markets. And also just so that I don't get perceived as like being an American, I'm not. Uh, but but uh, because what I'm going to say next is that like in financial markets, like really like no one cares that much about Europe. It's all about America. Uh, and what America does is what's happening and when when the us green greenlit this thing it it signaled uh it signaled an acceptance um in you know among in in the financial prof profession that i think was extremely much more profound than here because like i said our product was created in 2015. at that point you know you, you had a ton of people who'd never even heard about it Right. So that so that that happened was not significant in that sense. Right. It was not like a political battle. There was no regulator that was like holding out against it or whatever. It just happened in Sweden. And the Swedes were like, oh, yeah, yeah we'll do this. And then that product existed. Right. But in the U.S., it was like a big thing because, first of all, it took 10 years. Right. I remember back in 2013 when the, the Winklewai uh, we're trying to start the first Bitcoin ETF. And that circus went on, you know, for 10 years uh, until it finally got approved. And it, it was the approval itself. And then obviously the, the significance proved itself in the flows that came 
you know, the billions of dollars of flows, right? Because America is the 800 pound gorilla in the room. Like the size of the, uh, of the markets over there are just enormous. And the amount of money that are in there ready for allocation is just gigantic. You know, we, we've spent like a decade uh, getting up to an AUM of six and a half billion. Um, and, you know, what, what is BlackRock at now after like seven months or whatever they're you know just it's just like the scale of things is just so different it's so different um so i think that's probably why the significance is like much more pronounced and and it's you know it was like a big media thing and like all of that whereas in europe it's kind of just like happened organically over time it's just been chug chugging along and the product structure here is great uh and the products are you know they're they're good and they have been good um, and and the regulators here have been you know uh, not always super you know happy but uh, they've they've you know it's been a sequential process of you know things happening over time it's uh, I I think we all wish it would happen faster and bigger and everything but it's happening here here as well and you know we're we're, we're, we're chugging, we're chugging along, uh, you know, trying to get those flows. So that's, um, that's just the way uh, things are. That's really interesting for me. I, I feel like the, the, the biggest impact are probably still in, in, in front of us because a lot of, a lot of those things are just like getting started, uh, in, in the Bitcoin ETF field, uh, it's also like big companies, then they have the possibilities to do that. Uh, they have like big processes uh, of like decision makings and those things. It's interesting to, to to see that playing out. But yeah, there's definitely more more money now coming into Bitcoin than before. Totally, and and uh, the American spirit is a lot more aggressive than in Europe as well. Um, Europe very much has a mindset of uh, uh, caution, wealth protection. People here are not always all about like what's gonna grow the most and the fastest and the most aggressively there's a lot more thought to what's already what's already there protecting that you know the the american approach is a lot more risk tolerant i think um and so i, I just think americans just have a tendency to be willing to take big risks and lead uh, just i'm i'm gonna do this i'm, I'm doing it <laughs> you all can not do it i'm gonna do it i'm gonna do it and if if it works out great if not then all right whatever i mean it's not the end of the world uh so i i, I think i think there's something going on in europe that's like repressing the previous uh spirit of uh adventureness and um uh, expansion mindset uh because that's certainly not like a historical european thing for sure <laughs> So there's something going on in the culture here in Europe that makes things um, slower. Yeah, I, I, I feel that too. Like uh, it's different uh, when you look in America to uh, what's, uh, what's going on in, in Austria and in, in Europe where, where I'm based. Uh, really cool. Uh, as we're already uh, kind of in the end um, mm -hmm. of the podcand, uh, we have an end routine where we have two questions. The one question is always the same for each guest. And yep. the question is, what can we learn from you besides Bitcoin? Uh, learn from me? Well, I made a lot of mistakes. You probably learned from those. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, I don't know. I mean, I, uh, I, I'm interested in a lot of things. I don't know how much I have to teach about that, though. I feel like I'm still learning. Yeah, um, that's a really hard question. I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure what people can learn from me other than how to not do a bunch of stuff. Uh, but, um, uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, <laughs> sorry. It's, I, I, don't, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's fine. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I love that question though, because, um, it, uh, sometimes brings in new things and a lot of people, uh, actually just say, uh, yeah, a family something mm. related to family or mm. they play some instrument uh, yep. or something like that yep. um, uh, and something re sometimes really um, extra things are coming in and I'm like oh interesting I, I thought uh, with 
the, the one thing that comes to my mind is like um, uh, Katie from the the uh, um, Plan B passport. Uh, I asked her, and she's like, "Oh, how to be a mother? Like, I'm a radical mother. Uh, I feed my kids steak." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it, and it, and she and the, the kid is still like uh, really a toddler, like a really a, a, a baby. And so yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's uh, I mean, spring interesting new things uh, in there, but it's uh, it's fine. My, my daughter loves steak. Uh, she uh, and and she prefers the fat. <laughs> she just wants to eat the fat. She calls it the squishy bit. Uh, which I think is <laughs> squishy bit, <laughs> squishy bit. But uh, I mean, I am actually pretty good at making soup. I love a good bone broth, and uh, I, I love making broth. Uh, I just love making soup out of bones. I don't know what it is about it, but just like uh, because I, maybe because I have a background in chemistry, and so just like making this, I, I feel like this is my this is my lab work like at home just extracting minerals and protein and stuff from bones just gives me a weird pleasure <laughs> so you can make soups out of bones and it bone yeah bone? interesting i never bones heard of that. are the they are the main ingredient of a soup <laughs> i would say oh, that, man. that's like that's the actual soup everything else is just flavoring and like garnish and stuff like it's the bone broth and the collagen and the minerals that you get from the bones. That's the real soup. Everything else is just like to make it a little different. Oh, I never knew that. That's, See, that, that's what I could learn from you today. <laughs> absolutely. This is going to revolutionize your cooking because once you start making your soup and your sauces and all of that with bone broth, you're, you're, you're going to start really impressing yourself and other people. So, oh, I, I, and you're gonna start I feeling great. That. Never knew that. It's amazing. It's so good for you. It's like the best stuff. It tastes so good. Drink it every day. <laughs> oh man, yeah. No, thank you for for telling me. I I didn't knew that at all. Like I, I didn't knew where. Uh, yeah, soup. Interesting. I have to uh, d dive deep into that later. I'm already excited. Really cool. Um, before we come, uh, now we have the end routine uh, where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest. And the okay. question for you from the previous guest is, where will most Bitcoiner live in 2035? So like probably what's the highest density uh, of, of Bitcoiners in, in the world? In India? The highest density, not the most. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, he, he asked of where will uh, the most Bitcoiners live, but I feel like uh, the highest density is a more interesting question sorry yeah. for changing the question <laughs> yeah no so very interestingly right now according to chain analysis the answer is the same wait in uh, india they are the most uh dense like they, they are the highest percentage of bitcoiners in india yeah well so it's getting a little bit because of how popular stable coins are it's getting a little bit harder to parse the the data to see like who's doing what uh but yeah nigeria india uh brazil some some of these uh um, some of these emerging market countries with shock and awe, terrible uh, fiat currencies are uh, are some of the ones that have the the highest amount of, uh, of Bitcoin ownership. Um, in 2035, okay, that's 10 years from now. Um, uh, I think uh, the US actually. Um, you see, they seem to be in a good a good path towards that. Yeah, really cool. Thank you so much. Before I let you go, um, sorry, you wanted to say something? No, no, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, before I let you go, uh, where can people find you, ask you questions and, and read more about you? Uh, sure. You find me on Twitter, uh, but I, I'm, I'm only there during work hours uh, anymore. Um, but I am on Noster. Uh, I, can, uh, I can post my NPUB. Um, I can send my NPUB to you. But yeah, I mean, if you want to ask me questions, yeah, Twitter is probably the best. I, I just probably... I probably won't answer until I get back to work and like, I, I don't look at it over the weekends anymore. Then, you know, you can, um, you, you can follow the research that we do on the, um, uh, we, we have obviously our website, uh, which actually doesn't work right now. It's being reconstructed, but it, it will be the main conduit to find the stuff that we write. But right now, uh, probably our medium blog, which is our like halfway house between websites, uh, so you can, you can go follow me there. There's a lot of stuff that I've written there over the years. Um, but yeah, for asking me questions, uh, yeah, I'd say Twitter. Uh, and I'm uh, C underscore Bendixson. 
Really cool. Thank you so much. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much also for being on and, and taking the time uh, today uh, here with us. Um, oh, sorry. Before I make the outro, one small hint. They're not a sponsor of the show, but I really would love to uh, get to know all of my audience as much as possible in Bitcoin Amsterdam. Uh, so if it is, uh, if you're watching and listening and it is possible for you uh, to come, come to Amsterdam financially and like feasibly, uh, like definitely come there and, and visit us. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to see as many people as possible. I love the Prague one. I was in Prague uh, and there was already the, the podcast and I, I got to know so many uh, people that listen to the podcast. I got to know so many people that were guests on the podcast. And uh, I would love to do that in, in, uh, in Amsterdam too. The one uh, thing that I changed now in Prague, I had like five podcasts within like uh, 40 hours uh, where I was there. I now don't do any podcast while I'm in Amsterdam because I want to be with the people there. I want to spend time on uh, on the floor wherever, like I will be running around everywhere to, to meet as many people as possible. Uh, and that's what I, I, I would like to do. And uh, if you haven't had a ticket till now, you can use code Robin to, to get 10% off. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm, they're not a sponsor or anything, uh, but I would really, really love uh, to meet uh, as many people as possible there. Uh, and you will also see uh, Chris there uh, and many others from, from my podcast uh, there. And yeah, so that's, that's all for today. Uh, thank you so much uh, for being on, Chris. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, as always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.